Let's begin our service by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the summary of the law. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. But especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray together for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. It's not fair. If you've had children, you've probably heard them say that at some time. For some people, their entire way of looking at the world is through the lens of fairness. I'm talking about the way we sometimes compare ourselves to other people. Be it by the way we look, or how much money we make, or how we measure success. Some people come to the conclusion that they have ended up in life in last place. And it's just not fair. 
Now, I want to make it clear for, at the outset that there is a place to fight for fairness. There are real injustices in the world, like poverty and inequality. Christians have a responsibility and a call to minister to these injustices. However, what I'd like for us to think about today are the times when we almost stamp our feet childishly and say to God, it's just not fair. And so Jesus tells a story that challenges our ideas and feelings about fairness. Let's pray before we begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Our Gospel reading today touches on the issue of fairness and the sheer grace of God. Before we look at Matthew chapter 20, let's look at the context, meaning what has just happened before Jesus tells this parable. Jesus has just had a conversation with a rich young man. Remember the story where a young man comes to Jesus and asks a very good question. Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you ask me about what is good? In other words, you know what's good. God is good. So follow his commandments. And so the young man says, check. Yes, I've done all of those things. What else do I have to do? And Jesus says, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. What? When the young man heard this, it says that he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And we can imagine him thinking to himself, well, that's just not fair. Jesus' 12 disciples heard this exchange and asked, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter says to Jesus, see, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus basically answers, you're going to have the kingdom of God, eternal life. And then tells him that many who are first will be last and the last first. And so now Jesus tells them a story to help them understand. Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. In the Bible, the vineyard has been an image for representing God's people. There's a moving passage in Isaiah chapter 5, which describes God as the vineyard owner who's upset that even after all the care he's given his people, his precious vineyard, the vineyard is now producing bitter, wild grapes instead of sweet, cultivated ones. He could not find good fruit in his vineyard. And so it's likely that our text today would have struck a familiar tone with Jesus' listeners. But the ending of the story would have been quite shocking. It's intended to show us that God's thoughts and ways are very different from our, of our own, especially in light of this whole issue of fairness. You see, Jesus had a way of telling stories. And where we find ourselves sometimes to relating to some of the characters by the end of it. And sometimes we relate, as it were, to the wrong ones. For the kingdom of heaven is like, in other words, <clears throat> this is how the kingdom of God works. 
It's like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Jesus is using a story to illustrate what God is like. And of course, the various ways that people interact with God. It's time for the grape harvest. A storm could ruin the harvest, so timing is crucial. The day begins at dawn, 6 a.m., and ends at sunset, 6 p.m. The pay, a denarius, is the normal daily wage, but it would actually be very generous, especially for an unskilled laborer. So there's something strange about this employer. He sounds generous, and the employer could have sent someone else. Instead, he takes the initiative and goes searching for prospective employees himself. He cares about their situation. He wants to give them work and a generous reward. In a society with no welfare provision or trade unions, where unemployment meant starvation, the action of the vineyard owner in employing extra workers whom he did not really need so late in the day was, I think, an act of generosity. Notice verses 3 and 4. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too. And whatever is right, I will give you. Standing idle in the middle of the marketplace was the equivalent of basically waiting in the unemployment line or attending a job fair. This employer, the vineyard owner, is an unusual employer, as I mentioned. He doesn't just go out once to seek out these people. He goes repeatedly through the day. He's persistent. He doesn't give up. He searches until he finds them. Now that, to me, sounds like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. Six o'clock in the morning, 9 a.m., noon, and even three o'clock in the afternoon, he's out hiring people. Is the harvest big? You know, are the workers so few? Does the vineyard owner just want to help people out? What is Jesus saying about God in this parable? What is the kingdom of heaven like? Maybe we need to look at the last group of people to get hired because that's where I think the story is building to a dramatic conclusion. Verse 6. At about the 11th hour, he went out and find others standing. In other words, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, meaning there's only one hour in the workday left. And he asked them, why haven't you been working today? Now, I think their answer is revealing because no one has hired us. In other words, no one wanted them. We might guess that they're hungry. They're unemployed, having nothing productive to do. And as the day drags on, maybe they're even losing hope. Perhaps they were the kind of people other employers tried not to hire. The ignored, the invisible, the unremarkable, the least, the last, the lost. But our gracious vineyard owner tells these guys, you're hired. So that evening, he tells the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. Now, the timing of the payment at the end of the day was customary in Jesus' time, so that the workers could buy their families food for supper. But... Paying the last workers first was probably told purposely by Jesus so that the first workers in the story would see how much the one-hour workers got paid. Again, the vineyard owner does something very unusual. The big surprise to everyone is that he pays the 5 p.m. guys the very same amount as the ones who started working at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
The last who had worked only one hour get paid the same amount as those who've worked all day. They all get a full day's wage, the same reward. Now that doesn't seem fair, does it? So verses 10 and 11. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. That's just not fair. Doesn't that sound familiar to the elder brother in the parable of the prodigal son? Verse 13, the vineyard owner says, friend, heter in the original Greek language. Now that should get our attention, and I'll tell you why in a moment. In, the effect, in effect, the owner is saying this, friend, can I show you an agreement you signed this morning? You agreed to work for $100, correct? Yes, I thought you did. It's a very good wage for a day's work, isn't it? So, what are you complaining about? Are you demanding that I tear up the agreement you willingly entered? The vineyard owner is telling them in a nice way they're in the wrong. That's why I mentioned the word friend, heter, in the Greek. That word is used three times in Matthew's Gospel, and in each case, the recipient is in the wrong. Judas is one of them. Remember the story in the Garden of, of Gethsemane when Judas, Judas comes to betray him. Jesus says, friend, do what you've come to do. The vineyard owner is fair, generous and kind. Life is unfair sometimes, but God is never unfair. It wasn't unfair. No one was underpaid. It was just that some treat, were treated with unreasonable, as it were, generosity. And that is what the kingdom of God is like. God's grace is not limited by our ideas of fairness. His gifts are far beyond what we deserve. But like the elder brother in the story of the prodigal son who I mentioned, we find it hard to abandon our human scale of values, especially when comparing ourselves with other people, and then to accept the large-heartedness of God towards those we regard as undeserving. Thus, the disciples' re-education went one stage further to embrace the divine principle of the first being last and the last first. Listen to this from Romans chapter 9. But what can we say? Was God being unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I choose and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. That is the heart of God all through the scriptures. So receiving God's promise is not up to us. We can't get it by choosing it or working hard for it. Jesus' simple story about workers in a vineyard suddenly becomes charged with an incredible reversal in our thinking. So look at the last part. Verse 14 and 15 basically says, no matter how long or how hot the day, no matter how hard the work, there are no claims on God's to owe us anything more than he's already given us, which is everything. His grace is everything. The story touches on fairness, but of course this is more about the amazing grace of God. All the workers in the story were equally undeserving of the vineyard owner's generosity. So who's to complain? 
The question arises, who were the grumbling workers anyway that Jesus is addressing then? Well, they, they might have been the Pharisees or the religious leaders. They often come under fire from Jesus. The disgruntled ones may have been even the chosen people of Israel. After keeping all the laws of Moses for 2,000 years, they now see the Gentiles, outsiders, being welcomed into the kingdom of God by Jesus. Remember, remember, he even welcomes tax collectors and sinners. Even the disciples themselves may have been the ones Jesus is referring to. Remember when they were complaining to Jesus in the previous chapter that they'd given up all to follow Jesus. Shouldn't they get more than God than every from God and everyone else? Jesus' message is clear. Our place in God's kingdom does not depend on our worthiness or even our good works. It all depends on the sheer undeserving favor of the only one who is perfectly good and who accepts those who can never be good enough or work hard enough. It's all about grace. We find the very same message in the Apostle Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 2, when he, when he says, God saved you by his fav special favor when you believed, and you cannot take credit for this. It's a gift from God. One day, you and I will stand before our God as workers in his vineyard. Now, imagine standing before our holy God and demanding of him, give me what is fair, give me what I deserve. Are you comfortable with a fair God or a gracious Lord? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the unreasonable generosity of God in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the power of the gospel to save us from what we deserve, giving us eternal life, forgiveness, the hope of your eternal kingdom. Father, we pray that we would be a people of grace a people of unreasonable generosity to other people. And so, Lord, we bless you today, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our service with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we pray together the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, 
throughout all ages. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Thanks for joining us.